Okay, good morning everyone, buenos dias. Excited to have you join. Thanks for tuning in either on our live stream on Facebook or Zoom or perhaps watching this recording later. My name is Lisa and I am the Justice, Peace and Integrity of Creation Coordinator for the US Federation of the Sisters of St. Joseph. And I have the pleasure of being an MC today and sharing uh, some fabulous speakers, some fabulous witness of what's going on in our country, especially at our border. Just to note that this is being recorded. Um, so if that, if you want to turn your camera off or need to, feel free to do that. This is only a 30 minute program. We will have a little bit of time after that half hour mark. If people want to come off mute and say hello, we welcome that. Um, but without further ado, I'm excited to uh, start our time together. So one moment while I get something queued up here. So today we're gonna share an update on immigration realities at the US-Mexico border. Um, this is a 30 minute session, as I mentioned. And we know that in the past week alone, we witnessed planes and buses full of migrants who have been used, frankly, as political pawns and dropped into places like Martha's Vineyard, New York City, Washington, DC. We're also approaching the one year anniversary of um, the Border Patrol's racist actions against Haitian migrants in Del Rio. And we know that places across the world, including Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, and Pakistan are feeling the impacts of the climate crisis. So there is a lot for which we lament, and there's a lot we can do as well. We know we can't work towards a world where all are one until we get a better understanding of what's happening. So it's people, it's important for people like us to continue to share relevant, accurate news uh, from the sources. So today we'll hear from folks who recently visited the US-Mexico border, from people who are uh, working currently on the US-Mexico border, as well as uh, really fantastic advocates who are working towards policy change to make the US a more hospitable place for all dear neighbors, regardless of race, religion, ethnicity, country of origin. So we'll be called to act collectively as well. So I'm excited for all of those things. We start as we do with many things with prayer. And today I'm delighted to share that we have a St. Joseph worker from the Orange community who will be leading us in an opening prayer. Victoria Burgess is originally from Brooklyn, New York. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong thing. You're not, you're, you're from Queens, New York. Sorry for the mistake. And you attended Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Victoria majored in molecular cellular biology and Spanish and has a desire to continue to work in the field of public health, uh, engaging in research, community work, and data analysis. 
Her passion is working with vulnerable populations in the field of mental health and wants to work at the intersection of science, psychology, faith, and the arts. So Victoria, go ahead and lead us in an opening prayer and we'll make sure that Lucy has her screen shared for that. Thank you so much for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. So I'll lead us in the prayer that I received. Merciful God, many are the journeys your people have taken. Abraham's journey led from fear to understanding. Moses's journey led from bondage to liberty. The disciples' journey led from death to new life. Even today, your people journey. Immigrants and refugees, pilgrims and nomads, searching for hope, searching for opportunity, searching for peace, searching for you. Lord, I know that I too am called to journey. Yet too many times I have heard your call and my feet have remained unmoved. Continue to call me beyond my comfort and into encounter. And when I meet a companion on the road, may we find in each other's embrace. Let us share the journey. Amen. Thanks so much, Victoria, for leading us in that moment of centering. Really appreciate it. So now I have the great pleasure of introducing the real stars of the show today, our, our esteemed uh, guests. So first person I want to introduce is a sister of St. Joseph, Sister Deirdre Griffin. She's a sister of St. Joseph from Springfield, Massachusetts. And since January of this year, she has served as a staff attorney on the detained team for Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center, which is located in El Paso, Texas. And she's serving in that capacity as a Marianol lay missioner. Prior to her time there on the US-Mexico border, Sister Deidre served as a director of international programs at a SSJ sponsored college, worked in refugee resettlement with Jewish Family Service of Western Massachusetts, and, is a, and has served in private practice of immigration law. So thanks Deidre for being here. We also have Sarah White, who is a current St. Joseph worker participating in a year of service with the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, California. Her placement is the St. Joseph Justice Center, and she currently lives in community with four other St. Joseph workers. She's originally from Brooklyn, New York, and graduated from the University of Scranton with a degree in biology and philosophy. It's a good combo. And Sarah was involved in the Center for Service and Social Justice and has a passion for serving for and with others. She's led a virtual immersion program with Crispas in El Salvador, participated in immigration meetings with state representatives and served within Scranton's immigration, immigrant community. Sarah believes that immigrants and their stories are the heart of our communities. And I definitely agree with that. She's excited to be part of the Justice Center uh, this year in her work and plans to pursue a graduate degree in ecology. I love that. Thanks Sarah for being here. Finally, last but not least, we have Apolonio Morales, or Polo. He is the Director of External Affairs at the Coalition for Humane and Immigrant, Immigrant Rights in Los Angeles. He joined Sherla in 2014 as a political director and more recently transitioned to External Affairs Director. Prior to his work with Sherla, he was a labor organizer with the California Nurses Association, United Steelworkers Healthcare Workers Alliance, and in a community organizer for Contra Costa Interfaith Supporting Community Organization and Berkeley Organizing Congregations for Action, where he served as interim director. So a lot of organizing background with Polo. He's a child of undocumented migrants and Polo has dedicated his life to advancing pro-immigrant policies, changing uh, what is a very strong anti-immigrant narrative in the United States. And he graduated from Cal Berkeley with a BA in English in 1999. Go Bears. So thanks, Polo, for joining us today. Um, so we're going to first hear from now that we've all got a little introduction of our great folks here, we're going to first hear from Deidre. So take it away. 
Thanks very much, Lisa, and greetings everybody from El Paso. Um, a five to seven minute snapshot of the reality of immigration detention um, from my perspective. So I ask your forgiveness in advance if this comes um, through as a bit analytical because um, there's a lot of information to take in in order to be able to reflect on um, what I hope we'd be able to do from here. Uh, so my ministry primarily is with two um, aspects of our life here in El Paso. And part of what I love about life here at the border is that life is very intersectional, right? You can't just sort of hang your hat in one place and think you're going to understand a whole lot. So, um, and we also know that we need each other as community to be present here in ways that are loving and transformative. Um, so I spend most of my time uh, working with what we call our detained team at Las Americas Immigrant Advocacy Center. And I also spend some time at a shelter called Casa Vides, which is part of the Annunciation House Network here. And for me, those two things are integrally connected because what I experience daily uh, with folks who are arriving at the shelter informs a lot of what I'm able to do then uh, working with folks in detention. And detention is one piece of the much larger reality of immigration support here at the border. Las Americas also has a team that works with folks in our community who may be eligible for certain types of immigration benefits. And we also have a team that works in Mexico, so in Ciudad Juarez, um, in relationship with people who are stuck there, uh, particularly right now because of Title 42, and helping to identify folks who may be able to um, move through some sort of exception to various kinds of policies and to advocate for them. Um, to give you a sense of scale, Las Americas is tiny. We are a tiny little seed um, of about 25 people. And our detained team is a team of five people. And so in the six months that I've been here, we have really um, done a deep dive in terms of how we think about our work and come to a point of embracing the framework of abolition, the abolition of detention and of the prison industrial complex as the context in which we do our work in the gospel. And for us, that means as the only team of lawyers who are actually entering into the detention centers here in Texas and New Mexico, trying to empower as many people as possible to tell their stories in ways that will help them access a very broken legal framework which right now the only tool that most people have to work with is the concept of asylum. Um, and the reality is that while it can offer someone a foothold to be able to continue their journey, our legal structures for dealing with the reality that brings people to our borders are broken. Um, and so a lot of what we do is what we call know your rights or um, legal orientation kind of work, as well as monitoring conditions in detention. There are four detention centers within an hour's radius of our office, and the conditions in those centers vary tremendously. Um, not that it's a good situation for anyone, but some of the, condi the conditions in some of the detention centers are quite horrific. Um, so we have chosen to focus on the one closest to us, which is called the El Paso Processing Center, in terms of being able to use our resources in a sustainable way. I had never really thought about the behemoth uh, economy of detention as consciously um, as I do now before I came to Texas. And so I just want to share with you broad strokes. Um, there are over 25,000 people being held in detention right now across our country as of September 10th. And another important aspect of that is that 24,000 of those people were actually taken into custody in August, which means that there's a tremendous amount, a rate of turnover, people coming in, people going out, people coming in, people going out. Um, and we want that to happen because we don't want people stuck in detention, but it also makes it very difficult to hold systems accountable for just and humane treatment of people. The other piece of that reality is that there are over 300,000 people in our country who are currently being monitored by immigration. Um, and actually my focus right now with our work at Las Americas is on what we call post-release support, because you don't wanna lose the benefit of the great work that's been done to have someone get released because they don't understand the complexities of the legal process that they're now a part of. Things like reporting changes of address and changing the court so they don't miss their next court date so they don't wind up getting deported in absentia. Um, so invite all of you to um, find a local refugee resettlement or immigrant advocacy organization to be part of offering that radical hospitality of God 
um, wherever you are and happy to talk further. I will drop a few links in the chat um, just for some updated information about detention and also about the work at Las Americas. Um, we need to be questioning why we are using imprisonment as a tool to deal with what is a profoundly humanitarian global crisis. Um, and Lisa also just asked me to make a quick note about Title 42. Um, the situation here again is changing. We've got hundreds of people arriving every day from Venezuela right now. So both the um, immigration and the shelter systems are overwhelmed. And part of that is uh, being resolved or addressed by ICE by pulling the officers who have been working on exceptions to Title 42 to work instead on processing people from Venezuela. So it's sort of gone from bad to worse for people who have been precluded from requesting asylum by Title 42. Um, and so we need to also sort of continue to be present and to raise questions about what's now going to happen to those people who have been struggling in Ciudad Juarez for over a year and a half. So thank you, happy to chat with anyone anytime. Thanks, Deidre, for your witness and connecting the dots around detention and incarceration. I think that's a really important point. Um, I just had a quick follow-up question for Deidre. Uh, in terms of who's getting detained right now, is it single people? Is it families? Are you seeing any demographic shifts really quick or any kind of primary countries where people are from? Uh -huh. um, so the narrative has been shifting for the last year and a half or so from a primarily a narrative of people coming from Central and Latin America um, to a much more diverse narrative where now it's about 40% of people are coming from those countries and the rest are coming from all over the world. So it's a story of great diversity right now. The interest of the government is to move as many people as possible as quickly as possible. So we generally don't see families or children being held in detention for very long. The majority of people being held in detention are single men, um, primarily because the legal assessment of that is whether someone is a flight risk or not. And so a lot of our work is about helping people prove that they have um, interest in staying in the United States and resources to support themselves. We are seeing an increase in the number of women who are being held longer in detention. Um, and that's tied into the larger question of what I would call the border industrial complex. There is money to be made. Right now there is a, just a whole other contract and facility um, funding for holding more women in detention. Um, so it's it's always a dance and a bit of a dual-edged sword, right? So um, in terms of countries, I've actually been connecting with a number of people from Senegal, um, people from Ecuador, um, and people from Colombia, um, most so, who are, and the, they would be people who have gone through you know, what is on average, if there is such a thing as an average of about a month in detention before being released. Okay, thanks so much for that context. It's helpful, helpful for us to get a snapshot of what's happening in real time. Grateful for your work. Okay, we're, I'm gonna turn it over to Sarah who recently spent some time with her St. Joseph Worker community at the border in Tijuana, in uh, between San Diego and Tijuana. So Sarah, take it away. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. People arrive at Catholic Charity Shelter in San Diego, housed in a repurposed hotel from all over the world. After weeks of travel and days in ICE custody, immigrants are released to Catholic Charities, where they receive food, water, a COVID test, and access to a clean hotel room. Then they once again begin the travel process, seeking bus, train, or plane tickets all over the United States to reach their final destinations. Some immigrants quickly purchase tickets with the help of a sponsor, while others encounter unexpected roadblocks. Today, I will offer you just glimpses into the journeys of the many people the St. Joseph workers met at Catholic Charities in San Diego. This year's workers who are engaging in a year of service through the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange while living in community, Arlena, serving as a community advocate with Project Kinship, Victoria, working in mental health resources with St. Jude Hospital, Margaret, acting as a health advocate with La Amistad Clinic, Lucia, serving in Community Health and Mission Hospitals Family Resource Center, and myself, working in the St. Joseph Justice Center on Immigration and Environmental Justice. Lucia, born in Taiwan, reflected on the experience of offering comfort to others amidst the disheartening moments of feeling powerless against the obstacles that migrants encounter on their journeys. She wrote, the very first family that I helped was a Chinese family. 
The parents had traveled with their young child for almost two months in Latin America to reach the border. They had a point of contact, but that person wasn't able to provide them housing or other support. Despite this, they still wanted to go. I wasn't able to help them much beyond explaining in Chinese when and where to have them appear before the court and what they should do if they change their address. As I walked them to their car one day, I couldn't help but worry about their journey. With little English, will they be able to reach their destination? Or will they be taken advantage of because of their vulnerable status? The most difficult worry to forget is when their daughter, who loved to wander around and make friends with everyone, asked her parents if they ever would return home. I wasn't sure exactly what the little girl meant by home. It could have been her home back in China or a stable and permanent home that she had long missed after months of being a traveler. Regardless of the type of home that she longs for, she will probably have to wait another long journey to live in it once again. Sometimes it can be frustrating and a little sad knowing that there's little I can do to clear others' obstacles for them. However, despite our short encounters, I was glad to provide them with a little warmth and comfort during their transition and be a witness to the hard journeys they had trudged through. For me, seeing the smile and relief on clients' faces and small acts, such as handing them a new mask to replace their worn one, was a precious moment that gave me an opportunity to extend hospitality to those who thirst for it and a hopeful moment for a new life. Those were the words directly from Lucia, one of my community members. Similarly, my experiences in San Diego impressed upon me the importance of accompaniment when addressing a system whose oft obstacles often seem overwhelming. For example, Lucia and I sat with one man. We had communicated that we had very limited knowledge of Spanish, but he began speaking rapidly with intense hand gestures. While we only pieced together fragments of his story, his pain was apparent. He told us about his hard work, his separation from his family, and his detainment by ICE. He was made to feel less than human by a country for whom he had risked it all. A country whose flag he had tattooed over his heart before he had ever arrived. His pain revealed the failures of our immigration system. In labeling countless individuals as others, the system alienates immigrants from both their countries of origin and the United States. It separates people from their friends and family, treating humans as faceless rather than neighbors. Though there was little we could do, we offer this man the respect of being listened to. Similarly, listening to many stories in the Catholic Charities Call Center, Margaret writes about clients who called from their rooms to locate loved ones. She says, we unfortunately weren't well equipped to help locate people. It was possible that the person's loved ones were still being detained by ICE or had been taken to another shelter. One woman at the San Diego shelter later learned that her son had been taken to Georgia. The staff could check if someone had been in the San Diego shelter, but they have no way of knowing where else someone could be. The first day I was there, I spoke with a young woman who hadn't heard from her husband in four days. I was trying to comfort her and I took her to a caseworker who explained that unfortunately it was normal. The best thing to do was to, con to, to continue to try to contact both him and their sponsor. They were reunited that afternoon after I dropped off another group at the hotel. She was glowing. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case for everyone. The next day, another man came in to do a self-departure. He had been trying to locate his girlfriend, the mother of their four children. I tried to explain that he should keep trying to contact her, but he responded that she didn't have a phone. He gave us her name and a description down to the clothes she would be wearing and left his number, asking us to look for her and pass along a message if we saw her. And I did look for her, but I didn't see her. I later broke down crying because I felt like I had given him false help. And I didn't want to do that for anyone. That was a story shared from my community member, Margaret. In these memories lie the complexity of serving the immigrant community. Immigrants share your stories of resilience, hope, and joy but they also encounter great injustice and pain. To serve requires actions that often feel insufficient to overcome these injustices, but they are essential to valuing the lives of individuals. It is an experience of receiving more kindness and authenticity than one could ever hope to give. Learning from those who treat others with care and concern, even in the face of their own struggles, we are challenged to recognize immigrants as our dear neighbors, our fellow humans with dignity with whom we share our home. Thank you. Ooh, Sarah, thanks for bringing those that those touches of humanity that 
are so desperately needed in a really broken system. I'm really grateful for you highlighting that. And everyone will get links to the organizations that we're highlighting, ways to support them both financially in prayer and volunteering. So just to let you know, you're going to get more info in your inbox. Last but not least, I want to bring it back to Polo and say, what can we do about this? What can we do? What's going on legislatively? And also just generally what Sherla is up to. Yeah, definitely. So we have embarked on a national effort to get a registry uh, date change to happen um, here in the U.S. And so the last time the registry date was changed was 1986. And so what that meant was if you came before 1972, um, that you would go ahead and be allowed to apply for lawful permanent residency. And so what we're trying to do is bump that date up closer to 2015, uh, which would help about seven to eight million people be able to adjust their status. This would include TPS holders, DACA recipients, uh, the youth that don't qualify for DACA right now. Uh, it would include their parents. So it's very, very broad in terms of how many folks can be captured. Um, all of this is taking place uh, at the same time that DACA is in the courts and you know TPS expansion or, or inclusion is still up in the air, right? And so when we talk about solutions, um, and, and especially with folks that are coming from different countries, so we have uh, Afghans that are coming uh, to the U.S. We have Ukrainians that are coming to the U.S. Some of these folks are going to be left in legal limbo. And so as this ecosystem of immigration um, gets more and more complicated, we're trying to find the simplest solution to be able to get uh, something done. And so that's, we believe, is going to be the registry bill. Um, and th this is also to underscore, we are supportive of other pieces of legislation. So HR6, the Dream and Promise Act, uh, the, the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, uh, you know, the Essential Workers Act, like all these bills we're very supportive of. Um, we want to make sure that registry is part of the menu because it's a much more inclusive, it's not as narrow, um, but we you know, fully support those efforts as well. So we want to underscore that. And so as we're moving closer to elections, uh, there's an update in terms of the House Bill uh, HR 8433, uh, which has a long name, which I won't get into because I'll probably run out of time before I finish. <laughs> um, but HR 8433 um, is that registry bill. It's a rolling registry bill. And so that means that if we set the date to 2015 on the date of introduction, it keeps rolling into the future. And so if you did, you came in, let's say 2016, then you just wait a year before you, you can then go ahead and apply for lawful permanent residency. Uh, why? This is the simplest way uh, to be able to adjust people's status who inevitably end up living here, starting their lives and everything that that entails. And so the the it's already existing law, number one, it's just a two-page bill, which is just updating the, the date. Um, and we believe this is a way um, that can create that political space for more folks to be able to be included in larger uh, path to citizenship efforts. And so uh, at this point, we have 60 representatives in the House uh, in the House that are supportive. They've co-sponsored the bill, which is great, um, all across the country, not just California. I'll mention that. Uh, and then the other is we are expecting a Senate introduction next week. And Senator Padilla... Uh, we'll be introducing that. I, we believe that there's a couple of other senators that are signing on as well. We'll have more information in terms of the details, uh, but this will be significant because this actually now gives us an opportunity, right, to consider this as we enter into the lame duck or, you know, come what may in this upcoming election, maybe future possibilities in 2023. And so I'm going to stop here because I know we're short on time. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And if you want to be part of this uh, campaign effort, we can put you on the national, uh, the, the uh, listserv that we have for this effort. Thank you. Back to you, Lisa. Yeah, and Polo, thanks for sharing um, the registry. I love the idea of the fact that it's like a two-page bill. It's kind of this simple tool that can really impact a lot of folks, you know, seven to eight million people. Um, the Federation has signed on as a national endorsing organization, and we are really open to partnering with you all um, to lift up. And so if there's a particular action, if you want us to be able to sign up to get updates, if there's a particular um, representative or senator you're trying to move, we're here for that. Um, and we're excited to mobilize for that. So um, we are wrapping up our time together. I know we've covered everything from detention and uh, what's going on, say, in El Paso where we've covered a little bit more about uh, what's happening in San Diego and Tijuana. We're also learning a little bit more about what advocates have been doing 
um, at the federal level for legislation. And there are a lot of moving pieces. And so I just wanna highlight that the Federation can continue to convene calls, whether it's just a phone call or a Zoom call, for people to remain updated, knowing that things change quickly, right? Um, they change quickly and also the ARC takes a long time to move towards justice. Um, so we're gonna close out with a prayer that Victoria will offer once again, because um, we always need prayer and action together. Um, Agreed. So, yeah. Thank you. May our loving God be with you during this difficult time. May you cross bridges that bring you hope and overcome walls that separate. May Our Lady of Guadalupe be with you. May her mantle protect you and keep your family from all harm. Do not be afraid. Am I not your mother? Amen. Amen. May Guadalupe be with all those crossing, those detained, those waiting on news uh, from their family member, wherever they might be, from those who are trying to navigate these complex systems. And may we too also work to protect and um, bring more humanity to this, to this uh, immigration system. So it is at the half hour. So as promised, I will stop the recording, but, um, or actually let me just ask if there's any general questions before we stop the recording to any of our speakers in particular. Happy to take that. And then if you have to go, we'll see you around and you'll get some more resources via email if you registered. Um, but any particular questions, feel free to raise your, use the raise hand feature or put it in the chat. We'll take a few minutes for questions. Questions answered, okay, excellent. Polo, is the, I had a question about the, like who's sponsoring it. So you're saying that there's 60 co-sponsors in the house and then it's gonna get introduced in the Senate theoretically next week, is that correct? Just to clarify, like some of us are not as steeped in a, the political and legislative, like what does that exactly mean? <laughs> yeah, so there will be a uh, bill co-sponsors um, or authors, co-authors that will be introducing in the Senate. So Senator Padilla is leading that effort. We'll get a better sense of, you know, who's actually going to be part of that initial introduction in the Senate. In the House of Representatives, there's 60 folks, and you can see them here at this link. Uh, okay. for this. Great. And then we had a question about what is the status of Title 42 and uh, the Remain in Mexico or MPP? Deidre, I don't know if you wanted to address that a little bit more. You touched on it a bit. Sure. Um, so the MPP, the so-called Migrant Protection Protocols, or the Remain in Mexico policy, um, has been suspended. And at least here in El Paso, all of the people who were waiting across the border in Ciudad Juarez um, have been able to come to the U.S. for their next court hearing and not been forced to return to Mexico. So um, at least here in El Paso, um, that has come to an end. Title 42, however, is a different story, um, and Paula may have some political perspective on this, not sure, um, but the Biden administration has gotten the affirmation from the courts that uh, they have gone through a sufficient process in terms of lifting the implementation of Title 42, which for those who may not be as familiar, it's actually a public health protection law that was used to prevent people from coming into the United States. And that was precluding people from exercising their international law right to request asylum and protection in the US. So not sure why that has not yet been lifted. Um, one major concern about Title 42 is the disparate impact it has on people from various countries because the degree to which it can be implemented depends on the relationship between the United States and the person's country of origin. So. For example, folks from Venezuela, the US does not have diplomatic relations with Venezuela right now, so people cannot be deported from the US to Venezuela. Um, but people from other countries um, are allowed to stay in Mexico. So um, that is still a major moral humanitarian concern. Um, and as I mentioned very briefly, there had been um, during the last year or so, a kind of a broadening of ways to help people demonstrate that they should be admitted as exceptions to Title 42 families with children, people with medical issues, children traveling on their own. Um, and at this point, uh, the immigration agencies here, at least in El Paso, 
um, have pulled the staff who were processing those exceptions to shift to um, start to process people from Venezuela in a more fluid moving fashion. So the concern right now is that we still have thousands of people who are really languishing in Juarez and in other places around the country along the border who've been waiting for a very long time. Um, so there is a, a, an intense moral um, imperative there right now to, um, to bring this to an end. Thanks, and I feel like it's important to highlight that it's an internationally protected law. You know, it's a right to seek asylum, and so that's effectively not happening and hasn't happened. So it's a, it remains perilous. Yeah, thanks, Deidre. Any other questions? Otherwise, I'll stop the recording, and folks can feel free to come off mute, uh, say hello. Always try to say hello, build community across the screens. Um, any other questions? Okay, well, thanks folks for joining. Uh, I'm 